All right, Max Dassey is with me. So, Max, a lot has happened in your life since last spring training. Where would you want to start in telling how things have evolved since you arrived at spring training with the Angels last year? Yeah, things have uh, evolved pretty well, actually, uh, as of recently. And, you know, going into camp last year, I had a hip injury, and then... Um, you know, my my, uh, my son was born uh, extremely premature, three and a half months uh, premature. And, and uh, you know, I was fortunate enough that the organization let me rehab there in Chicago and be there with my family. And, um, yeah, we spent 198 days in, in the NICU. And, um, yeah, my son, he was, he was born at a pound and a half, and he's, he's now 17 pounds currently. And he's doing great, and, and uh, he's got a big smile on his face each and every morning. And, and uh yeah, we're happy with his development. So, you go into Angel's spring training the complex one day and you get a phone call from your wife, Gabby. What was the phone call that you received? Yeah, um, yeah, it was yeah March 20th of, of last year, you know, just driving into the facility and, and she told me that, uh, yeah, her, she was um, about to, to deliver. Um, you know, she went into, to, uh, you know the hospital and and uh so immediately i went you know right to the airport and didn't have anything and flew into uh you know midway and you know i ran through the the airport and ran through the hospital got there and um yeah so it was uh, obviously it was a very stressful time and and uh yeah she was able to deliver four and a half weeks later um a lot of prayers were answered throughout this this long journey that we've we've been on but uh yeah, it was a pretty pretty wild time. So what happened that day that she called you? She had a, an emergency visit to the hospital, but she was clearly not expected to be delivering that or even coming close to being in a position to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It just some some things we'll we'll never know, and and uh, yeah, it just kind of happened, and you know, jumped on that plane and, and got out there as soon as I could. When you got there, what were they saying? Yeah, they they were saying. Um, you know, they they don't perform uh, life-saving measures before 22 weeks. Uh, currently, she or at the time she was at 21 weeks and five days. So um, she was able to. We were able to get to you know 22 weeks so they could perform the life-saving measures. And then um, you know it, it was a very low percentage that it you know he would stay. Our our son Jax would would stay inside uh, till you know that the end of that week. And um, yeah, like I said, a lot of prayers were answered and. You know, she delivered at 25 weeks and four days, and and uh, yeah, he was he was born at a pound and a half, and he uh, yeah he he's been through a lot, and he's an absolute warrior and um, the strongest person I know. What were they saying about outcomes when he was born? Yeah, it's I mean it the the doctors they don't even know. Um, you know exactly what what can happen so they run you through all the different uh, scenarios once you know he's, he's about ready to come out so I remember talking to a, a NICU doctor actually we were in the delivery room and and it was about 30 straight minutes he just went through kind of every scenario and um, you know all the people that they had in there what their roles were what they were going to do um, obviously very nerve-wracking for you know my my wife and I and and uh, just throughout that in, in, entire uh, you know, a few hours that we were in there. Was there a chance he would not survive? Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And um, that was. Uh, we always knew that, um, but I always knew that uh, he would he would come out on the other side. 100. percent It was just he has this resilience in him, and um, just that I, I knew in, in my heart and soul that that he was he was going to be here with us. How tough was it to? see your wife go through this your son go through this because when you get pregnant you're expecting healthy baby you're hoping for that obviously but this was not happening for you for whatever reason yeah it was extremely tough I mean it was the toughest time of our life um, yeah you you know when when you're you know significant other gets pregnant and and uh, you know you're just so excited and you want everything to go smooth and you know always checking in on her and and when it didn't, you know, you're, 
your heart just drops and, and you just go into protect mode, whatever she needs, whatever he needs, and just uh, trying to oversee everything and, and uh, take care of the family. And, and uh, yeah, that's, that's really it. It's just your, your sole focus is, is on them. All right, so when you saw Jackson for the first time, what was going through your mind? Uh, yeah, my heart was racing, obviously, uh, like any other uh, delivery or any other dad uh, for the first time um, seeing their child. But uh, he came out, he cried, which was a great sign. And, and uh, you know, we had maybe a couple seconds uh, with him when he first came out. And then they rushed him over to the, the NICU area that was set up in the, in the hospital room or in the delivery room. And then, uh, yeah, they, they got him all set up. And then, um, you know, him and I went upstairs about 30 minutes later. And, um, yeah, he was, he was being taken care of. And, and uh, the hospital was amazing. How long was were they both in the hospital for? Yeah, so my wife, she was uh, she was in the hospital for four and a half weeks um, initially, and then um, right out she was able to be discharged uh, right after Jax was he uh, he came, and then Jax he was there for you know 198 days uh, in the NICU. So we spent uh, majority of last year in the hospital and. Yeah, it was it was a long time, but every day is uh, a new day, and you know we we're waiting on test results constantly, and and uh, yeah, a lot of good outcomes. What was the turning point? Because I'm sure there had to be some dark, very unsettling days and moments for you. I would say the turning point actually was when he he got a trach. Um, so he was he was intubated. He was on the ventilator for um, his entire time there. Uh, you know, we had about five attempts to, to get him off, so they, they would transfer him to a CPAP mask, and um, he just wasn't ready. So um, once once we uh, made the decision that the trach was the best outcome for him and his development and um, for him to, uh, you know, go on and, and get out of the hospital faster, I would yeah. say that was a turning point. Obviously, it wasn't an easy decision, but um, to see the, um, the development start to catch up to where a child for, for that age should be was um, everything for my wife and I. What was giving you hope that this was going to turn out right? Um, I would say just the power of prayer, you know, praying and, and uh, knowing that this was in God's hands and out of our control. I think that uh, any family that's in that situation, um, I know what, what it feels like, obviously, and it's... Uh, you're very hopeless, uh, the stress, you know, the anxiety, depression, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, is at an all-time high. And your life's at a standstill, and you just want the best for, for your child and, and uh, you know, our family. But um, I just knew that he was a resilient kid just right, right from the start. And, um, yeah, he's, he's unbelievable. So there is an interesting connection that I have with this story, and, and that is that my cousin Craig is a NICU doctor at Lurie's. He started a dad's group at Prentice, and your paths crossed because he was talking to a lot of dads in your situation. Usually the focus is on the mothers, and rightfully so, but the dads are kind of, the, in some ways, forgotten or neglected, and you feel that, and you need to talk about it. So what did that dad group mean to you? Yeah, it was awesome. Um, you know, kind of our role as being a dad is to oversee the family, you know, make sure our wife and and uh, children are taken care of. And it was just, uh, it was nice to kind of get other dads in the room and we all shared our story and, um, you know, kind of the situation that we were in and, and to, you know, have the professional help from your cousin and his experience and his research. And it was uh, something I'll never forget. Um, it was, it helped out a lot. And just to like I said, connect with other dads and um, kind of just be in that room and, and uh, chat with them. It was, it was very special and I'll always be thankful for that. What words were you hearing that were making sense to you and helping you? I would say that uh, the stress for the, the NICU dad is typically the research that, that your cousin had done um, was that, you know, it's higher once you leave the NICU. You know, you're making sure everything's good once you're there, but once you get out, um, you know, typically the, the, uh, the mom, you know, her stress levels go down now that they're home, but, but for the dad, um, typically increases just because there's um, 
more going on, more responsibilities on your own. You don't have the nurses there mm -hmm. to, to help out. But uh, yeah, just having the awareness of that uh, was everything. I didn't know this until actually my cousin, Dr. Craig Garfield, told me this, that 10% of babies in the U.S. are born premature, which really surprised me. I thought it would be much lower. Were you aware of that statistic? It probably happened, if you did, after your son was born. Yeah. Um, you know, with, with us going through that, a lot of people reached out and, um, you know, mentioned that, hey, we spent some time in the NICU, and whether it was one day or, you know, a full year, I mean, it's all... Um, everyone's own experience and any any time they're scary but yeah there was a lot more people than uh, that we realized reached out and there's a lot of people that don't even know what the NICU is which is fine it's just you're never in that situation but uh, yeah it's uh, it's it's a lot more common than you would think it's been common even in the White Sox clubhouse James McCann when he was here was coming off a situation with his twins AJ Pollock as well mm -hmm. absolutely yeah I, I when I was in the NICU, I was looking up articles of, I mean, any, anyone that I could pull up, Google search, and, and uh, yeah, I came across James McCann's story. It was incredible. And then uh, A.J. Pollock, actually, I reached out to him. And then um, my wife and his wife, um, they actually became pretty close and, and helped, helped her out tremendously throughout kind of the, the entire uh, NICU process. So it was, it was, it was amazing that... Uh, they helped out and we'll be forever grateful for that. So meanwhile, you are a baseball player. This was going on. What did you tell the Angels and when did you tell them that you weren't going to be able to play? Yeah, like I said, I had the hip injury initially and, and uh, I believe that everything happens for a reason. Um, you know, with my hip uh, being injured and I was continuing to do my rehab out there. So I was keeping them updated on my rehab schedule and, and uh, and then once I became healthy, I, I elected to go on the restricted list in September. Um, so it, it, like it was, it was kind of a no-brainer for me, uh, family being number one. Um, you know, in that time, we had a lot of decisions that needed to be made, and um, there was no way that I could just leave my family. So they were fully supportive throughout the entire process of, of where I was at. And, um, yeah, a lot of teammates, coaches, people in the organization reached out to me checking in and it meant the world to me, and I'll be, you know, forever grateful for them. It is quite ironic that your wife was in Chicago, of all places. So she was what, working in Chicago? Yeah, my wife, uh, Gabby, she took a job at uh, Citadel. Mm -hmm. So she was working in human resources there for three years. And then uh, just recently had to uh, tell them she won't be returning because she's uh, taking full care of our son, you know, with, with me being on the road and uh, traveling around. Uh, so she's putting her career on on uh, on hold right now, but she'll resume hopefully in in the future. All right. So you guys moved to California. The off season is underway, and you get traded to the White Sox. <laughs> so actually, first traded to the Braves for one day, and then you get traded to the White Sox. How do you explain that? I don't know how to explain it. It was yeah, pretty pretty crazy time. Yeah, I got got the call that I was being traded to the Braves, and then. Uh, 24 hours later after that, yeah, I got the call that I was being traded to the White Sox and told my wife, I said, we should have unpacked our stuff. We, we should have just left it there. But uh, no, it was, it was very exciting to come back to Chicago. Obviously, we're familiar with the city. And um, for me, I'm a big foodie, so I love the food and, mm -hmm. and uh, excited to, to, you know, play for the White Sox. Living out there, I was always thinking in the back of my mind, it, it would be nice to play for for the White Sox or Cubs, you know, being in being in that city. So it, it worked out great to, to be here with the White Sox, and I couldn't be more excited. So how is Jackson doing right now? He's doing great. He's doing great. And like I said previously, he's 17 pounds. He's got a trach. Um, so he's he's spending minimal time on the ventilator, and he's making good uh, good progress. And uh, he just started to roll, too. And, and uh, so he's 10 months, too, right now. So. Mm -hmm. His birthday, April 16th, is, is coming up here soon, and it'll be uh, an emotional day for, for our family. What kind of dreams do you have for Jackson? Um, I mean, I just want the best for him and uh, whatever he wants to do. He's, he's, I feel like I uh, don't have to really tell him anything. He, for what he's been through and his resiliency, I think, uh, you know, the sky's the limit for him. 
What's his personality like? Uh, he's very, very warm to everybody. Um, you know, he, he loves people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what he grew up with. Uh, you know, there was all kinds of people going in and out of his room. So he's very comfortable with people, his personality. He's a very happy kid, loves smiling. Uh, he, hopefully he'll start laughing here soon. He's got a little speaking valve that, that we put on his, his trach and uh, so you're able to, to hear him make noises. And, and uh, But uh, yeah, he's a very, very warm kid. When he's older, say 10, 12, 15, whatever the age might be, what are you gonna tell him about his entry into this life yeah I haven't got that far yet because we're still uh, yeah we still have a lot of care with him going on right now so we're just trying to, to set him up for you know that time for when he is 10 or yeah. 10 or 12 and and uh, one day we will we'll tell him but I have thought when you know he's old enough and you know he falls down and scrapes his knee and tell him hey son you, that's nothing you have no idea what you've been through you're you're gonna be okay uh, how has this changed you as a, as a person? You seem like a very mature adult, but when you get thrown this curveball in life, it can really affect you in ways, prof very profound ways. Yes, uh, it completely changed my life and outlook on life. And um, yeah, that, not that it was uh, that far off before, but just putting everything into perspective of what really matters. Um, you know, it's all about, you know, health and, and uh you know your family and enjoying each and every day because um, you never know when it's it's going to be your last so and just I mean, I mean in general too it's the things that you used to think were important really aren't that important so um, like I said it's it's changed me a lot I'm looking forward to the day that you bring them to a baseball game by the way thank you yeah, I'm sure you too. do too <laughs> yeah 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 it's gonna be pretty emotional for me um, yeah that day I thought about it a lot obviously and um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to getting him and my wife Gabby out to Chicago and, and uh, having them enjoy a game. Yeah, You're gonna, you'll feel him in the crowd, right? Oh, totally, yeah. yeah. I feel him at all times, but definitely once they're there, it'll be an incredibly uh, special moment. All right, so I want to ask you about this team. What are you feeling about this team and what can be accomplished with the White Sox in 2024? I, I, I've got some good vibes going uh, about this team. You know, we've got a, we've got a good group of guys. We've got a good group of veteran guys, guys that have been around. Um, you know, we got some guys on the way too. Obviously, you know, everybody knows about the prospects that we have, and I think they can make an impact uh, at some point in the near future. But um, the guys that we have in there, you know, maybe they haven't had the best year last year or the year before, but guys have, have done some things in this game, and, and uh, you kind of reach a, a point in your career when you're at that spot, you, you really want to prove yourself and say, hey, I still got it in the tank. And um, I think that uh, we got a lot of guys in that situation, and including myself. So um, very excited, ready to get going and, and uh, play some good baseball. Yeah, it feels like a lot of the guys, including yourself, have a lot of fuel, a lot of fuel in there. And it's how you go about using it, right? And uh, taking whatever's in you to and all you guys coming together. Isn't that a part of it as well? Is It's what every every individual does, but what you, all you guys can do as a team. Because that was kind of missing here. Yeah, totally. I think that uh, Chris Getz, you know, he brought in a lot of guys with, with plus makeup. Um, I think that uh, that's number one. You know, you got to play well as, as a team and, and get together and, you know, enjoy yourself in the clubhouse amongst each other. So I feel that uh, we have the right chemistry in there and, and uh, it's just continuing to get to know the guys and, you know, not necessarily just on the field, off the field too, and, and be comfortable with them. And, and uh, yeah, it's, I think it's going to be a, a fun year. And working with Martin Maldonado, you guys overlapped with the Astros for a little bit? With that, or not the Astros, where was it? Didn't you yeah, play with yeah, Martin yeah. Maldonado? It was, yeah, it was in Houston in, in Houston, 2018. Yeah, yeah, there yeah it was, for there a was. couple months there. Yeah, yeah I'm excited to uh, be teammates with him again. And, you know, the work that he does behind the scenes is incredible. You know, the way that he, he handles a, a pitching staff, um, his knowledge, um, the studying he does, um, you know, obviously with him going to the World Series, it seems like every year since then, um, you know, he's doing six years in like, a row. Yeah, 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 just six. So, yeah. oh, no, no, six ALCSs in a row. Oh, six ALCSs, yeah. yeah. So, doing that and catching the guys that he has, um, you know, he's got a wealth of knowledge and he's been incredible too, um, just like he was back then. So, I'm looking forward to working with him again. Okay, and one last thing, and 
We're here at Camelback Ranch on the White Sox side. On the other side is where the Dodgers play, and there's this guy who's over there, Otani, <laughs> who you used to catch with the Angels. Got a story you can share with what it's like to be around maybe the greatest baseball player of all time? Yeah, I, I mean, what everybody's reading and hearing about him is true. Um, you can't even really put into words how incredible of a talent he is. Um, to do it on both sides of the ball, you know, pitching and hitting. I mean, a lot of us, we struggle with doing one thing. Um, and he's out there, you know, one of the best at both. So, um, you know, his focus, his mindset, his work ethic, um, just his ability to make adjustments, um, it, you know, mentally, it's just, it's all off the charts. And uh, you just can't really, you can't put a ceiling on him because, I mean, it, he can do anything he puts his mind to, and, and uh, it was an honor, and, and uh, it was really special to share the field with him and, and work with him, and um, I wish him nothing but the best. Is there a pitch, is there a game, is there a moment that stands out that you experienced with him? Yeah, I would say there was a game, it was in 2021, it was in September, he invented a new split finger fastball, so he had one that was more kind of vertical drop and the the new one it would go more to his right and uh kind of down and into to righty so um yeah he told me leading up to that start a few days before hey i'm going to use this new split finger so i was like okay all right let's let's see what it's about and then uh i remember yeah it was against oakland it was a day game and you know second batter we tried it out and it was swing and miss called it again swing and miss i think that game we called about 60 of them and <laughs> like seven <laughs> innings and 13, 14 strikeouts, something like that. And it was just like, that's when you know somebody's on a whole nother level when they're just able to add a pitch and just be confident enough to throw it that many times and have that much success. And, and uh, yeah, it was it was special. Well, you'll be telling Jackson about Otani. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I will, 100%. Okay. Congrats, you finished the video. If you want to build on that success, download the NBC Sports Chicago app. It's got highlights, exclusive insights, and push alerts tailored to you. Everything you need to be a real Chicago sports fan. Download it now.